the early 1930s, one of the busiest band leaders in New York City was a violinist named Nat Brusilov. A jovial, stoutish man in his mid-twenties, Nat had worked his way up through the ranks of bands led by Meyer Davis, Irving Mills, Paul Ash, and Fred Rich to become one of the preeminent radio conductors, leading orchestras that broadcast daily over the coast-to-coast -coast networks of both NBC and CBS. For a few brief years, Nat enjoyed fame and fortune. In addition to his radio work, he appeared in films, toured the country with Kate Smith, and generally lived large. But the effects of the Great Depression, coupled with his own mischievous streak, led to a swift decline and tragically early demise. Nat was born in 1904 and raised in Baltimore. By the time he was four years old, it was evident that he was a child prodigy and he entered the Peabody Conservatory at the age of six. And it is said by his mid-teens that he could sit first chair in any symphony orchestra in the country. He played in and around DC as a youth, and in, then in the late 1920s, he made his way to New York, and he was immediately immersed in that bustling jazz and popular music scene. Dorsey Brothers, Miff Mall, Joe Venuti, Eddie Lang, Ukulele Ike, uh, Tony Parenti, Matt played with all of them. His reputation as a violinist second to none grew rapidly. Vitaphone wanted him for talking pictures, Vega wanted him to promote their new electric violin, Broadway shows wanted him for their pit orchestras, and radio beckoned with so much work that he needed a police escort to get from one studio to another on time. As word of his extraordinary talent spread, so too did word of his increasingly elaborate pranks. While broadcasting, if Nat sensed the presence of a studio tour group, he would drop his trousers and conduct in his BVDs. When conducting for Morton Downey, he and the famous tenor would drop to the floor and wrestle at the end of a vocal refrain, while the rest of the orchestra did their best to play as if nothing were happening. Once, while on the air, he locked the studio doors and quickly stacked several tables on top of each other, boosting the trombone and accordion players to a precarious perch at the very top to be close to an overhead microphone. Turning to face the engineers through the glass, he accidentally bumped the bottom table, sending the makeshift tower tumbling to the ground with a thunderous crash heard by radio listeners across the country. Nat's antics earned him the nickname The Clowning Conductor, and in an industry that demanded efficiency and strict professionalism, he soon found himself in trouble. Sponsors dropped him, and the networks terminated his contracts. Nearly three years of steady work as music director for Kate Smith came to an abrupt end. By the end of 1934, following months of unemployment, Nat was bankrupt. In the years that followed, he struggled to support his wife and two children, by taking occasional conducting and performing work in radio and theater orchestras, but he never regained the success that had made him a household name in the early 1930s. Years of hard living took their toll, and following several heart attacks, Nat Brusilov died in 1951 at the age of 47. Near the end of his life, my father finally realized that his extravagant personality meant leaving his family with no assets only debts. Hoping to provide them with income from royalties, he wrote an original composition titled 
cold turkey. But my dad is not playing the violin on the commercial recording. To be economically successful, a big name was critical, and the name Brusilov was not big anymore. Consequently, Florian Zabok did the commercial recording. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you, Carol. Here's Carol's father, Mr. Brusilov, to play not the hot canary, but a tune he wrote called The Cold Turkey. <laughs> of his career, Nat's frenetic schedule of broadcasting, touring, and performing kept him out of recording studios. With virtually no commercial records to his credit, when his career faded, so too did the memory of his name. Few dance band collectors and enthusiasts today have ever heard of Nat Brusilov. Fortunately though, Nat did record. In 1930, the fledgling Judson Radio Program Corporation hired him to make a series of 12-inch, 78 RPM records to be distributed exclusively to radio stations. Nat Brusilov and his orchestra recorded dozens of popular selections, all excellent examples of both hot and sweet dance music of the day. Today, the Judson recordings are exceedingly rare, and in many cases, only a single copy is known to survive, and some other titles remain as yet undiscovered. I happen to have one of these Judson recordings right here. These were 12 inch 78 RPM discs and they were single face, all they recorded on one side. And the unusual thing about them was that they were center start. In other words, you would put the uh, tone arm down at the middle of the record and it would work its way out. <laughs> Rivermont's new two-CD set, Out of a Clear Blue Sky, brings together more than two dozen of Nat Brusilov's delightful Judson recordings, reissued here for the first time, and supplements them with several of Nat's transcribed radio programs for Shuron and Unguentin. The set also includes a complete 15-minute live CBS broadcast from 1932 with vocalist Welcome Lewis and a half dozen high fidelity recordings Nat conducted for wide range transcriptions in 1934. All recordings, more than two and a half hours of music, have been expertly transferred and restored by renowned engineer Doug Benson for superb sound quality. The deluxe 48 page booklet features an in depth look at Nat's life and career, written by two time Grammy nominee David Sager, with dozens of rare photographs and a detailed discography for collectors. I am a very proud and fortunate woman to have had such a warm, loving, and brilliantly talented man for my father. But unfortunately, he was also unwittingly self-destructive, hell-bent on making people laugh. It didn't matter if he was conducting an orchestra, 
if he was on stage or on the air. If he thought he could trigger your laughter, he might decide to drop his pants. Your laughter was all the applause he wanted. Laughter was love. Matt Brusiloff and his orchestra, out of a clear blue sky, provides a fascinating, intimate glimpse into the life and career of a popular radio band leader of the early 1930s. This treasure trove of bright, cheery music is as entertaining and engaging now as it was then. Take it easy, Nat. You'll live longer.